In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about risk. We've considered threats, and now we're going to be looking at vulnerabilities. Before we do that, I just wanted to talk about this picture, which is a set of images of cats that have been generated completely artificially using an artificial intelligence technique called Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. So it's important to realize that these cats are completely synthetic. Uh, they don't exist, but incredibly realistic through this approach. What we're going to be able to cover in this, these videos on vulnerabilities is to understand vulnerabilities and how they are rated and reported. Know about uh, what OWASP is and what the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities are. Understand how vulnerabilities can be mitigated using controls. So a vulnerability, just to remind you, is a weakness in an organization's assets that when exploited by a threat will lead to economic loss. So in the ISO 27000 standards, ISO 27005, Information Security Risk Management, uh, talks about the following areas. Organizations, process and procedures, management routines, personnel, physical environment, information system configuration, and hardware, software, or communications equipment dependence on external parties. And what we're interested in is really the last two when we're talking about vulnerabilities. So looking at ontologies of vulnerabilities, um, this is an overall diagram of cybersecurity ontologies. And uh, we're concerned with the vulnerability ontology in the right hand corner, which talks about uh, various uh, attributes of vulnerabilities. For example, whether it needs to have user interaction, uh, whether privileges are required, uh, the impact that it will have and vulnerability type and various other um, attributes of that. And of course, it's related to threats by the fact that they're exploited. Um, it's related to a product uh, and a version, patch availability, etc., because that will determine whether the vulnerability is present. Uh, intelligence is really related to vulnerabilities in terms of the fact that uh, it's used to discover those vulnerabilities. And finally, it can be mitigated by using countermeasures, controls, and that's what we will consider as well. So when a vulnerability is discovered, it's usually reported but to the organization responsible for the product that they are given time to fix. So a zero day vulnerability is one that is unknown or unfixed by the manufacturer of the product when it's exploited. And so the zero day refers to the length of time in which the um, actual vulnerability has been known and a fix has been available. So obviously zero days are sought after vulnerabilities by threat actors wanting to exploit them because they know that there was unlikely to be a, a fix. There's also a period of time um, between the disclosure of a vulnerability by an organization, for example, Microsoft, and the time that most organizations will take to actually uh, patch that vulnerability. And so quite often vulnerabilities become known when they're uh, essentially announced by the manufacturers and announcing that there's a patch or a fix available and the time which organizations actually fix it. And that can actually be quite a long period, including some organizations that will never fix or patch the vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are reported and fixed by a patch or upgrade of the software product and then reported for inclusion in public databases. So some of those databases include the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, CVE, that's run by MITRE, the National Vulnerability Database in the US, that's run by NIST, and another one called VolDB, um, which is a, another organization that runs that. As I mentioned, disclosure comes with problems because it may help disseminate and promote exploit, exploits. And there's an actual market for bug finding, you know, paying uh, hackers and others bounties to discover and disclose uh, bugs in a 
um, professional way, i.e. directly to the company involved um, so that they have time to fix it before announcing it. And if you're a security researcher, there is an ethical way of actually disclosing bugs. It's not the case that all companies will, relax, will react positively to that information, nor will they necessarily treat you as in a positive light and see it more as a nuisance and more as you as a threat uh, in and of itself if you are the researcher reporting it. There's also a very active market for selling zero days, both to criminals, um, but increasingly to governments who are trying to stockpile these zero days for their own interests, and they can run into the millions and millions of dollars. So vulnerabilities are scored, and um, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, NVD uh, has a vulnerability scoring measure which looks at a variety of different attributes, so the attack vector, whether it needs to be local or physical, or whether it can be done over a network, whether privileges are required. Um, so obviously, vulnerabilities are more serious if you don't require privileges, and they can be accessed remotely over a network. If user interaction is not required, again, that makes it more serious. And then finally, the impact on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And that can be rated as none, low, and high. CWSS is more complex and based on three measures. So it captures the inherent risk of the weakness, confidence in the accuracy of the finding, and strength of controls. And those are uh, calculated into a base finding. The attack surface, as it's called, so the barriers that an attacker must overcome in order to exploit the weakness and then environmental characteristics of the weakness that are specific to a particular environment or operational context. So you can see that with high scores, that gives you a, generally, uh, a general idea that the vulnerability is, is serious or critical, um, but it really does depend on the context in which the vulnerability is disclosed or operational or exposed, the attack service. Vulnerabilities are not really risks until they are exploitable. In part, proving uh, a vulnerability relies on showing how it can be exploited. So researchers often develop proofs of concept, uh, essentially a working exploit of that vulnerability. And there is a strong requirement to actually disclose those proofs of concept. But the problem is, as soon as those are disclosed, it makes it incredibly easy, uh, easy for other attackers to take those proofs of concept and then exploit them themselves. So sometimes researchers will be convinced not to release a proof of concept simply because it's uh, too dangerous. Now, it's very clear that even just indicating where the problem lies will give most uh, sophisticated threat actors enough information to develop their own proofs of concept. And so this is only really stopping the script kiddies, the people with little knowledge or willingness to actually develop their own exploits um, from getting them and exploiting them um, without uh, hesitation. So there are databases of known exploits to vulnerabilities. So Searchploit um, is one that comes as part of uh, the Metasploit framework, for example, uh, which we will be using in our vulnerability lab. Um, but there's a database that you can look up and look for specific exploits. It's important in terms of coordination of responses to threats that vulnerability information is shared. And so countries have computer emergency response teams, CERTs. Um, now they're called CERTs, but the term was actually trademarked by Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, in 1988, and so uh, there are a variety of different ways of, uh, of calling these teams by different names. They're all roughly the same in function, though. AusCert is Australia's, but all countries have their own, and AusCert operates out of Queensland. Uh, responsible for alerting organisations about specific vulnerabilities and threats. So uh, members of AusCert, for example, the university, would get information about new vulnerabilities and um, that would enable them to take action to 
uh, mitigate those vulnerabilities by patching, for example. So here's an example of an OzCert security bulletin. Um, it's looking at the product Spam Assassin, which filters spam. And it was reported by, or the Spam Assassin, uh, the publisher of the vulnerability disclosure was reported by Ubuntu um, because it's uh, on the Ubuntu operating system. And the impact is that it allows the attacker to execute arbitrary commands. And so that means they can craft commands and they can execute them on the remote system uh, and it's unauthenticated. So that's incredibly serious. So that means that I can craft an attack, I can run a command, say for example, uh, give me access to the machine by remote running a remote shell or stop this program or even shut the system down. Um, and so that's incredibly problematic. The resolution is to patch upgrade and there is a CV name. So the CV name is uh, the year uh, that was disclosed and also a serial number um, that is the sequence of the disclosures um, in that year. So uh, the description, suspend assassin vulnerability 1st of April 2021 and uh, another just a longer description about uh, the vulnerability itself. And it also talks about the release, the specific Ubuntu version that it impacts, which is um, 20.04. Here's another example of NVD um, talking about the same uh, uh, vulnerability. Uh, a little bit more detail here. And so here we get uh, the fact that it's the Apache product spam assassin and it talks about the actual specific versions of it that are affected so before 3.45 and that illustrates why it's important to know uh, the versions of software uh, and it relates to a configuration file that can be uh, essentially crafted uh, to run system commands without any output or errors so it's undetectable from that perspective as well so in, the exploit can be injected in a number of scenarios and in, a, in addition to upgrading to Spam Assassin version 3.4.5, uh, users should only use update channels or third-party.cf files from trusted space places. So it gives you a CVS uh, subversion number um, and it gives you a base score of 9.8 critical out of 10, which means that incredibly high. Uh, and then there's some, some disclaimers there. 